Today, we're really excited to speak with Deborah Wint Smith, the CEO and President of the Council on Competitiveness and the Global Federation of Competitiveness Councils. Both organizations convene university presidents, CEOs, leaders of national labs, and other thought leaders to develop and disseminate policy agendas around a really wide variety of science and technology policy issues. We're also very honored to have Deborah as a member of the JSPG Advisory Board. Deborah's bio is available at compete.org and sciencepolicyjournal.org slash advisory board. And she is on Twitter at dwinsmith, which we'll have in the sidebar uh, for the audience members. Deborah, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, Shailen. Delighted to be here and congratulations for your leadership as well. Thank you so much, Deborah. Deborah, the first question I have for you is, is JSPG and AAAS's call for papers is really focused on reflecting back on Van Verbush's Endless Frontier framework and kind of understanding the historical context for how our innovation ecosystem emerged and thinking about what tweaks, what changes, what pivots we need to make to shape an even better, more impactful, more efficient future of American science as we move forward. What's top of mind for you of late? What do you think are some of the most critical science policy topics that young people need to consider writing about? Well, thank you, Shale. And let me make a few comments about looking back to the time when Vannevar Bush wrote The Endless Frontier and the impact that this policy document had on our nation's science and technology policy, our investments in really unleashing an unprecedented era of innovation, productivity, growth, standard of living that had really at its underpinning um, science and technology. And, you know, when you look back at that time, we were in World War II, uh, obviously, you know, tremendous challenges uh, facing uh, existential threats to our, not just our economy, but our way of life and our values. And I think it's very important for young people to realize today that it was because we were able as a nation to harness our science and technology people, our engineers, our scientists, and couple them to the prowess of US industry and talented workforce that we were able to marshal the capability to win those two world wars with our allies. Now today, you know, fast forward, we're living in a completely different world. Uh, we have, you know, innovators and science and technology capability throughout the world. The United States has played a, a seminal role in ensuring that we have global growth and prosperity as well as meeting national security. So in some ways you could say it's a back to the future story, but on the other hand, it's fundamentally different. And this is why young people today, as they look at their careers and going forward, need to be very, very excited that whatever field of science and engineering they choose to study and invest in and create a career, it's gonna have a profound impact on our economy, our standard of living, our productivity, and addressing these huge global grand challenges that did not exist you know, some 75 years ago. And um, even in the last 10 years have emerged at the forefront. So it's a very, very exciting time, but also it's a new time because we have entered into a new age of innovation. And Deborah, you know, throughout your career, you've worked with some of the most senior most leaders in, in virtually every sector from academia to industry with, Fortune 500 CEOs and, and heads of states, given your breadth of expertise working with senior leadership, what's some advice you would give young people, uh, scientists, engineers, policy professionals, students who, who want to study and write, but also engage and enact uh, new science policies? What's some advice you would give young people for working with uh, having intergenerational partnerships for that work? Well, that's that's a great question. And I think I'll just start by saying, you know, when I started my career at the National Science Foundation many years ago and was working in establishing scientific cooperation with the then East European Soviet bloc countries, 
One of the things that I realized early on is that science and technology, the knowledge and domain expertise is critical. But as you move into the policy arena, you have to be a systemic thinker. You have to be an individual who can recognize what's important, but connect the dots. And so as you begin, you know, anyone beginning their career, it's very important to have domain expertise. And of course, some individuals are gonna really wanna spend their career as, as deep, deep researchers in universities or companies and national labs. But in the policy arena, you have to be both a builder, willing to take risks, but also very importantly, someone who understands the implications of science and technology for larger economic and national security issues. So I'll just share an example. Um, I had the honor to serve in the OSDP, the White House Science Office, uh, under in the second term of President Reagan. I was detailed there from the National Science Foundation. And I put together a whole new framework for how we addressed our international science and technology cooperation and partnerships. And again, the impact really related to foreign policy, establishing relationships with parts of the world, particularly the Soviet world where we didn't have other ways of engagement. But very importantly, for the first time, we began to look at these science and technology partnerships in terms of how they impact our economy. And this was during the time we had intense trade and technology competition with Japan. And so I had the, the great honor to redesign the head of state uh, US-Japan science and technology agreement, which I'm very proud to say is still operative in that form and continues to be the basis for that very important deep relationship, but also it became a benchmark document for engaging with other countries. So being, being knowledgeable in a domain, but stepping out of that domain and understanding that you have to connect the dots and be a systems integrator when you make policy, because any policy cannot be developed and deployed in a vacuum. And then, Deborah, I wanted to ask you a specific question about the international front. I mean, of course, this call for papers is around American science policy, but you've just had such a depth of expertise in international science and international science and innovation. What do you think are some of the, the key topics or the key problems that we need to solve that early career researchers might uh, consider studying and writing about for this issue? Well, in terms of international collaboration, um, I think that that's core to science. It always has been. Again, look back to the uh, medieval and post-medieval scientists, Erasmus and others. You know, they had a very, very rich network of communication and collaboration in order to um, produce the knowledge that they did. Similarly, with Galileo and Newton and all the great scientists. So. Um, having international collaboration in science and technology, I think is fundamental to advancing knowledge and understanding. At the same time, I do think we have to be cognizant that there needs to be in any endeavor, you know, kind of rules of the game when we, when we play, you know, baseball or whatever game it is we do, you know, we have rules. And if you don't play the, by the rules, you don't have a game. So, you know, the Council on Competitiveness, needless to say, you know, given our mandate around productivity growth and standard of living and our technological leadership, you know, we think the time has come to really ensure that we have, you know, protection of intellectual property rights. We have fair and balanced access. We don't have, you know, malicious cyber attacks that are targeting specific technological capabilities. You know, during this past year of the pandemic, we had more cyber attacks than ever against our pharmaceutical companies, against our universities doing research in the field of virology and all of that related to COVID. So we have to have, you know, young people to understand that there needs to be some platform of, you know, regulation, protection of intellectual property you know, not having cyber attacks and things that enable the collaboration to advance our knowledge and things. So um, I, I think that's something I wanna share with everyone because 
you know, on the surface, people may say, oh, well, we're just collaborating and we can share everything. But many of the technologies, in fact, all of the ones that I mentioned, and I would add advanced materials, are dual use technologies. And they can be used, you know, also uh, in some very malicious ways, as we're seeing in facial recognition, in digital control in Western China and other parts of the world. So um, that's something that on the international front, we need to have partnerships with our allies, with like-minded countries. And at the same time, we need to include, you know, others, hopefully, that will begin to participate in a more um, universal set of, of values around science and technology. As early career researchers are looking for resources to reflect on, to read, to cite in their papers, um, what are some uh, products that, that you might recommend they read from, from your organizations that you've let, uh, led? Um, you know, they, they could focus on any dimension really of science and technology policy. Um, does anything come to mind? Well, I, I should have mentioned this up front, Shailen. We're, we're very proud at the U.S. Council on Competitiveness. We just completed this December uh, a year of extremely intense work around our National Commission on Innovation and Competitiveness Frontiers, which is really designed to understand and promote the drivers of next generation productivity, inclusive growth, and prosperity. And our report, um, Competing in the Next Economy, a new innovation age calls for a new innovation game is something I would urge everyone to read. Uh, we have uh, four kind of pillars of, of strategic recommendations all around the concept of increasing tenfold uh, the number of innovations, the speed of innovations, the number of innovators, and very importantly, elevating and coordinating leadership and national strategies and innovation. And it's a very, very data rich report. Um, and I urge you know, everyone to take a look at that. Also, we have a longstanding group of chief technology officers from academia, industry, and national labs, and they have produced amazing um, reports over the years, uh, including some very uh, early looks at the business case for the deployment of many of these advanced converging uh, technologies that are that are reshaping our world as we speak, that the four great scientific revolutions, you know, the, the digital, the genomic, uh, the uh, nano and atomic and cognitive revolutions. So I urge you, I mean, these are all on our website, um, www.compete.org. Um, on the GFC, and, and we have a great report we just recently did um, of our university presidents that makes the case for increasing and ensuring our investments in R&D back at the level of 2% of GDP, which we had back in the 1960s. And, you know, we have very much declined in our federal investment of research and development. And I hope that is something that, that we'll see uh, reversed over the next few years. Um, on the Global Federation of Competitiveness Councils, every year we issue a statement of principles that all of our members from some 35 countries help create and endorse what are the drivers for global growth and prosperity. And we link them to the theme of our annual meeting. And so that's another uh, exciting document, but also I would share in the, in the GFCC, we have a great group of global university leaders and business leaders that are looking at, you know, how to accelerate the role of academia and national labs as drivers of economic development in their regions and in their locale. And, this is also very important for the United States. In fact, we took a lot of the work of the Global Federation and brought it back into the US. A number of our university presidents who were involved in this said, we need to be doing this in the United States too, because we know that we have uneven economic growth and prosperity in our country. And we can't be a thriving great nation that also has strong political cohesion if we have lots of growth and innovation on the west coast and in certain cities and then the majority of the country you know being behind when we have these great universities throughout our country thanks to the land grant act and the investments that we made in particularly in the uh, early late 18th but very much in the 19th and 20th century so all of these documents and, and important reports are on our website and um, 
I, I, and you know, we'd certainly love to have young scientists and engineers come and spend time with us as interns. That's always a, an open invitation. Um, and I think they, all of them who come love the council because one, we're working on the big important issues of the day, but also they have the opportunity to meet and engage with tremendous leaders from academia and industry and our labs and, and government as well. Uh, Deborah, thanks so much again. Uh, Deborah Wint Smith, President and CEO of the Competitiveness uh, Council on Competitiveness and the Global Federation of Competitiveness Councils. It's been an honor and privilege, and we really appreciate your support of the Journal of Science, Policy, and Governance. Thank you, Shailen, and thank you for your leadership. And it's always a pleasure to work with you. And you uh, are of the generation after me, but you're also one of our, our great leaders in science and technology policy. And so I appreciate very much everything that you do through the journal and your other endeavors as well. Oh, thanks so much, Deborah.